from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. The United States has said a final decision on military strikes in Syria has not been taken. This after President Donald Trump tweeted on Wednesday a threat of possible intervention. During a briefing, the White House's spokeswoman, Sarah Sanders, said Trump has not laid out a timetable for action in response to an alarmical attack in Syria. She added that all options are on the table and that the president is assessing how to respond. She also commented on the state of the U.S. relationship with Russia. Uh, again, the president has not laid out a timetable and still leaving a number of other options on the table, and we're still considering a number of those, and a final decision on that front hasn't been made. The president's been clear that the relationship with Russia is at a new low, and that's due to a number of factors. Trump took to Twitter once again and explained he never said when a possible attack on Syria would take place. He added this could happen soon or not at all. Russian presidential spokesperson Dmitry Peskov rebuked Trump's possible military actions in an interview with Russia's Channel One on Wednesday. He stated, quote, we do not participate in Twitter diplomacy. We do not participate in Twitter diplomacy. We support serious approaches. We believe that it is important not to take steps that could harm an already fragile situation. We firmly believe that the pretext of using chemical weapons in Duma is invented and cannot serve as a pretext for acts of force. I repeat once again, we would not like to take part in Twitter diplomacy. Meanwhile, top officials in the United Kingdom are meeting to discuss their response to the alleged chemical attack in Syria. British Prime Minister Theresa May has called for a cabinet meeting, although it is still unclear if she will ask for approval for a strike. Media in the United States have reported the White House national security team is also set to meet. Protests have been taking place across Brazil in solidarity with the jailed former president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, while a permanent occupation and vigil continues at the Lula Libre camp in the city of Curitiba, just outside of the federal police headquarters where Lula is being held. A large demonstration was held in Sao Paulo with thousands marching in the city center, demanding freedom for the twice elected president. Renata Souza, a former advisor and chief of staff for slain Rio de Janeiro councilwoman Mariel Franco, considers the crime against Mariel to be a political execution calling the detention of Lula a political imprisonment. The murder of Marielle is an attack on democracy, a democracy that is very fragile, and today people are seeing the fragility of this democracy with the jailing of Lula as well. People are very concerned about this situation in Brazil. People are learning of the situation of the military intervention in Rio de Janeiro, a federal intervention in our public security. And street acts of resistance are not the only show of solidarity for the former president. Brazil's Workers' Party Senator, Glessie Hoffman, has said that going forward she will be referred to as Glessie Lula Hoffman in the legislature. Workers' Party lawmaker Paulo Pimenta also formally requested that his name be changed in parliament to Paulo Lula Pimenta in a memo sent to the president of the Chamber of Deputies. Others say that they are following suit. This means that each time the speaker calls upon them during debate period, their name will be called as Lula, and it will appear as Lula on the electronic voting board. We will not at any moment falter. We want freedom for Lula because Lula is a political prisoner, a political prisoner within a prepared democratic government. By changing our names, we have two goals. First, to show we aren't living under a normal situation, because there has been a breakdown in institutional normality. Secondly, we are paying tribute to President Lula. Supporters of Lula's Workers' Party and Brazil's left have said that this is just the beginning of a series of events to be held for as long as it takes until their candidate is freed. 
For more on this protest in Sao Paulo, we go to our correspondent, Ignacio Lemus. We are in Plaza of the Republic, in the center of the city of Sao Paulo. Here, different social movements, unions, and civil society is congregating to repudiate the incarceration of Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva. We're coming off of a week of large mobilizations in the city of Sao Paulo. We have to remember that last Wednesday, social movements were present at a vigil during the voting that took place in the Federal Supreme Tribunal on the request for habeas corpus presented by Lula's defense. And from there, as Judge Sergio Moro ordered his arrest, social movements and the people of Sao Paulo maintained a position at the Metal Workers Union resisting so that Lula would be protected from facing the Federal Police of Curitiba. Now Lula is in the custody of the Federal Police Building in Curitiba. Mobilizations continue throughout various routes and access roads, leading to major cities, using fire and other forms of road blockades, as the people reject the judicial process under which former President Lula was convicted and sentenced to 12 years in jail. Right now, at this event, there is also a theme here of Mariel Vive, calling for resistance and demanding justice for the political execution against leader Mariel Franco, the Rio de Janeiro councillor who was assassinated about a month ago. People shout free Lula and Mariel lives here in the Plaza of the Republic in Sao Paulo. That was Ignacio Lemus from Sao Paulo. The Colombian Defense Minister Luis Carlos Villegas has denied involvement in any military action on the border with Ecuador where two Ecuadorian journalists and their driver were kidnapped on March 26. In a press conference, Villegas said that Colombia's intelligence services have been unable to authenticate a letter allegedly sent by the Oliver Sinisterra Front, in which the dissident group announced the death of those kidnapped as a result of military action by Colombia and Ecuador. We have performed an intelligence analysis of the letter allegedly signed by the Oliver Sinisterra Group of the FARC-EP, and we could not prove its authenticity. We have reiterated to the Ecuadorian Defense and Interior Ministers this morning our desire for cooperation and coordination. Above all, we have asked the Ecuadorian government that all parties respect and stick to the agreed lines of communication on this matter. We continue in Colombia where an explosion killed eight police officers on Wednesday. The death has raised a wave of support on social media. The attack occurred in the northwest region of Antioquia, where drug trafficking armed groups are gaining power, especially the so-called Clan del Golfo. Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos condemned the attacks and expressed his solidarity with the relatives of the victims. I would like to condemn in the strongest possible way the cowardly and premeditated attack on our police forces. I want to express our solidarity and extend our support to the families of the policemen who died. We'll take a short break now, but join us after this look at what our multimedia colleagues are reporting.
Welcome back. In Peru, social movements from Latin America and the Caribbean are meeting for the People's Summit. The gathering is an alternative to the Summit of the Americas and gives voices to those excluded from the main event. Indigenous, gender and LGTBI rights will be discussed as well as new strategies for social resistance. While the main summit of the Americas will discuss business issues, the People's Summit is organizing an anti-imperialist march to support revolutionary movements. Meanwhile, Peru is deploying more than 16,000 police officers near the venue where the Summit of the Americas will be held. However, residents have complained about the security measures because of the disruption to their daily lives and the cost of it. Several top leaders, including U.S. President Donald Trump and Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro, will not be attending. The summit does not benefit us in any way, not even for the Peruvian people, because the truth is, all this is collided with corruption. All this is total corruption. I see the news and I already believe that Peru is a narco state. The government of Panama is imposing economic sanctions against Venezuela. They include a 90-day suspension of all Venezuelan airlines operating in Panama. It says there are, these are reciprocal measures after Venezuela imposed similar temporary sanctions to combat what it called money laundering. More measures against Venezuela from the Panamanian Foreign Ministry. Measures that have some experts in international relations worried. It's worrying that Panama is turning into a platform against progressive forces, in this case against countries like Venezuela. I'm saying this because of the maneuvers our country is engaging in and its stance on foreign policy, which is deeply troubling. The declarations of the foreign minister were clear. She said Panama would step up its economic measures against Venezuela, including the suspension of Venezuelan airlines in the country, starting on April 25th. These are measures in response of the measures that Venezuela has taken against Panama. Panama justifies its actions against Venezuela in terms of defending democracy and human rights. However, it hasn't said anything about the electoral fraud and the deaths of dozens of protesters in Honduras. For some, this suggests that it is taking orders from abroad. It seems that our government is acting as a transmission belt for the dominant ideology. This means it's taking North American interests as the basis for its foreign policy. This shouldn't happen for two reasons. One is because of the neutrality treaty, and two, because we are not pro-imperialist. Another example is Palestine. Panama hasn't condemned the killings by Israeli forces in the Gaza Strip. And it is the only country in the region that voted against recognizing Palestine as a state. It has also kept quiet about the U.S. moving its embassy to Jerusalem. These results from the pressure of the Zionist lobby are here to turn Panama into a lackey of Israel. So Panamanian foreign policies are becoming very dangerous. It is a stance that most people do not share in Panama, a country with a deep, anti-imperialist tradition, born out of a century of living under U.S. occupation. Pope Francis has apologized to victims of sexual abuse in Chile after strongly supporting Bishop Juan Barros, who allegedly covered up sexual abuse of minors by his mentor, Father Fernando Caradima. In a letter made public on Wednesday, Pope Francis acknowledged he made serious mistakes in judgment and perception of the sexual abuse scandal in Chile. The Pope said he will meet with victims and the bishop to reestablish justice and bring serenity back to Chile's church. As far as I'm concerned, I recognize and want you to hear that I have made serious mistakes in my assessment of the situation, especially due to a lack of accurate and balanced information. From now on, I apologize to all those I have offended, and I hope to be able to apologize personally in the coming weeks. In the meetings I will have with representatives of the people interviewed. A year after the Salvadorian National Assembly approved a law against mining, there are concerns that the law may be revoked, especially after the results of the recent legislative elections. Social and environmental movements are concerned that right wing political parties, which will become part of the new Legislative Assembly on May 1st, will be supporting extractivist projects like metal mining.
Most lawyers will be representing right-wing parties such as ARENA, PCN, PDC, Ghana, parties which are not committed to the responsibility of solving our country's environmental issues. A law which prohibits mining was approved on March 29, 2017, after 12 years of struggle. This legislation forbade the use of cyanide, mercury and other lethal chemicals. A year after its approval, mining companies continue to operate in the territories. A mining company will destroy the soil, which will never return naturally. Mining is not renewable. The damage that is caused cannot be reversed. Talk about green mining or clean mining or responsible mining are concepts which are pure publicity. Environmentalist groups denounce lobbying done by mining companies, such as Pacific Rim and Oceana Gold, which will be able to restart gold exploitation in El Salvador if the law is repealed. Knowing how persistent corruption is among political officials and members of the right, we have no doubt that they may well be able to reform, modify and repeal this law. And that would be betraying our country. Some social groups demand that mining prohibition be elevated to constitutional rank and warn that if the law is reversed, protests will increase to prevent the return of mining to the country. We'll take another short break, but join us after this look at what a multimedia team has to report. Our greatest resource is the skill and the vision and the wisdom of our people. If your education falters or fails, everything else that we attempt as a nation will fail. If you succeed, America will succeed. Over half of all the Mexican-American children have less than eight years of school. How long can we pay that price?
Welcome back. The largest ever strike in British universities ended last month by widespread unease among university staff at pro-market reforms and their conditions of work continue. Our correspondent in London, Pablo Navarrete, has been investigating. February and March saw the biggest strikes in British universities and colleges for many years. Members of the University and College Union, UCU, a trade union representing staff in higher education, walked out in protest at planned cuts to their pension schemes proposed by Universities UK, which represents the authorities running universities in Britain. Strikes have taken place in 64 different universities, over 14 strike dates. Universities UK has been trying to push British universities to become more like market orientated businesses and they want everybody, students, staff, everyone that is apart from the university themselves, to carry more of the risk and that's why this has come about. The widespread rejection and anger by British university staff of this transfer of risk in their pension scheme away from their employer and towards the employee means they are scrutinising very closely any deals their unions make with the universities to resolve the dispute. Why should we go into our retirement into poverty? We should have a safe, secure pension, which means that we can retire in, com in confidence and in with planning. This is about the justice of our employment terms and it's also about the marketisation of the university sector. The drive to introduce pro-market reforms and cut government investment in all areas of the education system has been a main feature of the last eight years of the Conservative government in Britain. Well, they really need to be seen as the continuation of the austerity policies that have been initiated by the Conservative governments uh, since, since 2010. Uh, this is a continuation of the uh, £3 billion uh, pounds worth of cuts to higher education that were implemented in 2010-2011, as well as the tripling of the tuition fees to over £9,000 in the period of 2012-2013. While the mass wave of strikes by higher education staff in Britain is over for the moment, the fractured relationship between the staff on the one hand and university authorities and the government on the other is a long way from being repaired. Pablo Navarretti, Telesur, London. Now let's have a look at some other stories making headlines from around the world. At least 60 people have been killed in an ambush between Taliban and the police in Afghanistan's Ghazni province. The Taliban attacked and killed the governor of the province along with his security personnel. In response, the police killed at least 45 Taliban militants. Hundreds of demonstrators in the Central African Republic's capital, Bangui, have protested with 17 corpses of people killed in recent clashes between the UN forces and the local armed groups. Both sides have been fighting in Bangui's PK-5 neighborhood, a Muslim enclave within the majority Christian city. Violence has increased in the country after mainly Muslim rebels ousted its president Francois Bozis in 2013, provoking retaliation killings by armed Christian groups. We don't understand anything anymore. Is this mission about shooting at civilians or is it another kind of mission? We want an explanation and that's why we are here. We brought the bodies to speak to the national and international audience so they can see what happened and explain. Police and protesters have clashed in Lom as demonstrations against Togo's president Foreign Nasibne continue. Nasibne, who has been in power since 2005, is under pressure to stand down amid calls of constitutional reform. Ahead of this weekend's first Formula E race in Rome, Pope Francis has symbolically blessed one of the electric cars taking part. The Pope blessed the car parked up at the Vatican. And he also met with the chief executive of the Formula E series, Alejandro Agag. He also greeted the racing drivers. On Saturday, we will find out whether the blessing worked or not. And we've come to the end of this news brief. This and many other stories, you can find them on our website, telesurtv.net slash English. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.
tenemos que presentar Sudamérica, Latinoamérica, como no las ven.